All right. One of the fundamental questions of epigenetics is how a single cell gives rise to all of the complex cell types and structures of the adult body. There is, of course, an intermediate stage here of development and growth. And this developmental process is orchestrated by regulatory DNA elements, which act through sequence-specific transcription factors to control gene expression programs in precise spatiotemporal manners. As Daniel introduced yesterday, we can uh, map these regulatory elements because they are uniquely hypersensitive to the nonspecific endonuclease DNAs1. So if we sequence the short fragments released by this enzyme when we treat nuclei with DNAs1 and align them to the genome, we can get a quantitative genome-wide view of transcription factor occupancy in different cell types, shown here. And in my talk, I'll be using a regulatory element and DNAs1 hypersensitive site, or DHS, interchangeably. Now, the developmental patterns of regulatory DNA have been extensively studied in model organisms, but so far have not been systematically mapped in humans. So to address this deficit, we uh, sampled, we did DNA-seq on uh, human fetuses. And we performed nearly 200 DNA-seq experiments on 12 different organs spanning all major organ systems, and in addition performed 114 separate RNA-seq experiments on uh, 10 of these organs. And these experiments were done over time. So we sampled 27 uh, different days uh, spanning the weeks 9 and a half to 21 of gestation, uh, shown in these timelines here. So the number of samples is indicated to the left or the right of the timeline, and the uh, days sampled are indicated by hash marks with day 67 on the left and day 147 on the right. And overall in this data, we identified 2.3, nearly 2.3 million distinct regulatory elements in the human genome that are active during fetal development in at least one organ and in at least one day. And our first goal was uh, to take this large set of regulatory DNA and just characterize its activity across different organs. So a given organ, on average, uh, shown here in the gray bars, uh, has about 200,000 regulatory elements active. And the black bars, uh, horizontal bars, show the range of the data. So this is just for all the different uh, organ types. So this average of about 200,000 DHSs is on par with what we see for individual cultured uh, human cell lines. And our first goal was to take this uh, set and just collapse the temporal aspect of the data to ask, how do these regulatory elements vary in activity across these 12 different organs, which I've arranged here anatomically into their organ systems? So for example, endocrine tissue, nervous tissue, digestive, muscle, et cetera. So we performed a clustering analysis on this data, which is represented by this heat map. So here, each column is a set of DHSs which have been put into a cluster by the algorithm. And I'm displaying the median DNAs1 sensitivity uh, or accessibility uh, in this purple shading. So this cluster here in the very first column is, uh, contains DHSs which are highly active in adrenal tissue and not uh, as active in all the other tissues. So as you can see here, there are a large number of clusters which are organ or organ system restricted. There's a set of DHSs or clusters which, are, uh, which span multiple organ systems, for example, this one which is active in adrenal and kidney. And then there's a set all the way on the right that are active across nearly all organs or organ systems. And indeed, this very last column uh, contains uh, almost all of the promoters. So there are 50,000 DHSs in that final cluster, and half of them are promoters elements. So those tend to be active across multiple different organs. And over all these elements, we find that the vast majority of them are organ-restricted or have organ-restricted activity. So 67% of DHSs uh, are highly active only in a single organ or organ system, whereas 16% are active across multiple organ systems and 17% are constitutively active. And this phenomenon of highly organ-restricted activity is very specific or uh, pronounced for distal DHSs, which are far away from promoters. So you can, as you can see in this histogram, uh, distal DHSs are twice as likely as promoter DHSs to be active only in a single organ. And out here at the other end, promoter DHSs are much more likely to be constitutively active across organs than distal DHSs. Now if we look at the, uh, the landscape, the organ-specific landscape, this, so this is DHSs which are active only in a single organ, we see a great deal more variability than we did with just the total number of DHSs active in an organ. 
So here these are just ordered uh, in uh, decreasing order of size. And you can see that the brain, which is a very complex tissue and has a lot of different cell types that are doing different things over time, has the largest number of elements which are specific to that organ, 120,000. And here at the low end, we have uh, the leg muscle, which has just under 20,000 specific DHSs. Now, what drives this organ selective uh, pattern of DHS activity? Well, of course, it's the transcription factors which are binding to these regulatory elements. And indeed, we find a highly significant enrichment of the recognition sequences for these transcription factors in different sets of DHSs. So here I've highlighted a brain-specific cluster of 67,000 DHSs, and you can see that certain transcription factors uh, such as OTP, OCT4, otherwise known as POU5F1, and SOX1, which are known to be involved in neurogenesis, uh, their recognition sequences are highly enriched in these DHSs, uh, as is MEF2A. If I switch to this heart cluster, MEF2A is also involved in heart development, and its recognition sequence is highly enriched in this heart cluster, as are the sequences for NKX2-5 and HAND1, which if you knock them out in mice, uh, cause the mice not to develop heart. And finally, returning to this final cluster here of constitutively active DHSs, these are enriched for the recognition sequences of general transcription factors such as SP1 and CTCF, which you would expect to broadly bind promoter elements. So this data represents an uh, extensive map of early developmental enhancers. And one way that enhancer elements in the human genome have uh, typically been identified is to just take some piece of DNA that's usually identified through high uh, level of sequence conservation throughout evolutionary history and to plop it into a mouse. And so you put it upstream of a reporter gene that drives beta-galactosidase and you produce this pattern of tissue-specific expression and you say, aha, this, because this piece of the human genome is a heart enhancer or a brain enhancer because it lights up those tissues in the mouse. So we wanted to overlay our data with this set of uh, Vista elements that come from the Vista Enhancer browser. So we pulled down the 806 elements from the human genome that reproducibly drive tissue-specific tissue expression in mice. And remarkably, nearly all of these are DNAs1 hypersensitive or contain DHSs in the human fetal data. So I'm showing a histogram here of the number of DHSs in each element. So this ranges from one DHS in an element all the way up to nearly 20, with an average of about five DHSs in these elements. And in data that I don't have time to show, we produced a genome-wide map of enhancer promoter connections using our DNAs1 uh, data across organs. And 37% uh, of these DHSs, which we have li linked to the activation of a particular gene, coincide with these VISTA elements, which provides a hypothesis for the gene which these elements, these enhancer elements, are controlling. Let me just highlight two examples first. Um, uh, first, just to show that these uh, VISTA elements tend to be composite, what we call composite elements. So this one is, contains only two DHSs, and you can see that they're specific to neural tissue. But these other two that I'm showing here contain multiple DHSs. So this DHS is active across multiple tissues. Uh, this particular DHS is specific to muscle. But then this element over here is quite large. The scale bar is two and a half kilobases, and it contains seven DHSs, which have a variety of tissue specificities. So if you put this into a mouse, you can imagine it will drive expression of beta-gal in multiple, or multiple organs and tissues. So to highlight two specific gene-centric views of this data, here I'm showing PAC6, which is involved in neurogenesis and oculogenesis. And in this first track, I'm showing our, genome, our enhancer predictions for this gene. In the lower track, I'm showing the VISTA elements nearby, and this is about 400 KB upstream of the gene. And the, if we look at this first element, when it's put into a mouse in this reporter plasmid, it drives beta-gal expression in the neural tube, uh, the hindbrain, and the forebrain. And this DHS that's contained within it is highly active in the human fetal brain and spinal cord, so nervous tissue. Uh, similarly, these other two DHSs, which overlap VISTA elements, uh, the elements themselves drive uh, expression of beta-gal in neural tissue in mice, and the DHSs which in the, within them are highly active in uh, neural tissue in the fetus. One more example is TBX20, which is a transcription factor involved in heart development, and these three VISTA elements which overlap are DHSs that we have linked to the activation of TBX20 um, are highly active in heart in the fetus, and two out of the three are active in the heart in mouse. Uh, interestingly, TBX20 does have a role in eye development, so this element, maybe at some later point of development, development in the mouse, will be expressed in the heart, but it's heart, it's eye here, and heart in human. So given the unique temporal access of our data, we asked if we could identify 
genome-wide uh, temporally active DHSs, or those that vary in activity over time. So instead of clustering along the tissue axis now, we're clustering along the temporal axis and just looking at those uh, DHSs which are restricted to each organ. And indeed, using a, uh, the same clustering approach that we did for organ specificity, we find a number of activity patterns. So this representation is a sparkline plot that just shows time on the x-axis, normalized accessibility on the y-axis, and uh, for example, this particular set of 1,600 DHSs is active early and then goes down. So we find DHSs which are active early in development, late in development, or are constitutively active in all of these tissues. And if we look at the uh, tissue uh, uh, specific or um, transcription factors which are known to be involved in the development of those tissues, uh, we find, so starting off, the recognition sequences for these TFs would be enriched in these heart-specific DHSs, but we also find that they're enriched in specific temporal patterns or DHSs with those patterns. So for example, GATA6 and TBX5 are known to activate together certain cardiac regulatory elements. We find the recognition sequences for those enriched together in DHSs with a certain temporal pattern. Let me end by discussing uh, our RNA-seq data to say that one of our go the goals of this project is to try to identify novel developmental regulators. There are 1,600 transcription factors that are encoded in the human genome, but we currently don't have a complete understanding of where they act and how they might act during development, and uh, how many of them might be tissue specific. Remarkably, we find 90% of them expressed during human fetal development. And as you can see in this plot, where I'm just showing for each organ in a different colored dot, the total number of transcription factors expressed at a different, uh, at varying expression level cutoffs, you can see that each organ expresses a very large number of transcription factors. So at this fairly low threshold of an FPKM of one for RNA-seq data, uh, each organ expresses over a thousand of these transcription factors. And uh, with, at least with the time points we've sampled, very few of these are temporally active, so only one to seven percent vary more than twofold over the time, scan, time scales that we have. And we find uh, overall, if we just plot uh, gene expression versus the number of tissues in which a transcription factor is expressed, that they either tend to be constitutively active, so the majority are over here in this bar, or expressed only in a single organ. So there's a very small number of transcription factors which are organ specific, but most of them are constitutively expressed. This is highlighted with some specific examples here, where I'm just showing the expression pattern of the indicated transcription factor. Each organ is colored differently, and the shading, the intensity of the shading refers to the relative expression level of that transcription factor. So for example, uh, POU3F2, which is involved in Schwann cell development, is expressed in neural tissues. Uh, TBX20, which I mentioned with the VISTA enhancers, is only expressed in heart. So these are sort of the known and expected patterns of developmental regulators that we already know a lot about from mouse and other studies. But there are a number of transcription factors for which there's little or no functional annotation that have highly restricted uh, expression patterns um, or uh, other more broad expression patterns as shown down here. And there's this one ZNF556 that's expressed exclusively in skeletal muscle that I've looked into a bit further, and it appears that uh, of the enhancers that we predicted for this transcription factor, half of them are bound by MyoD, which is the master regulator of myogenesis, suggesting that this transcription factor is involved in, my, in the muscle development process. The surprising finding to me from this part of the analysis was that a very small number of transcription factors are entirely organ specific. So only 6% display a pattern where they're expressed only in a single organ system or only in a single organ. And in contrast, a very large proportion, 65% of them, are constitutively expressed, so we can detect a, at least a low-level expression in all organs. But given this constitutive expression, there is still a great amount of variation in expression levels. So 47% of transcription factors actually have broad expression patterns but have a really high elevated level in certain organs. So my prime example is MEF2A, which is broadly expressed, but if you knock it out in mice, they don't develop hearts. So it's very important for heart development and it's expressed at three standard deviations above the average expression level for all of these different organs. So to summarize, I've shown you that we've generated a genome-wide map of regulatory DNA active during human fetal development. Uh, we've also generated a genome-wide map of enhancer promoter connections and shown that these uh, tend to be active in the same tissues between humans and mice. We've uh, characterized temporal activity patterns of these DHSs. Uh, and then used our gene expression data to try to say something about transcription factors and uh, identify potential novel developmental regulators. 
So this work is part of the Epigenetics uh, Roadmap Consortium, and as with any big data project, involves a lot of hands. So I'd like to thank the uh, data analysis and processing team, uh, data production, the guys who actually did the experiments, um, and our PI, John Stamatornopoulos. Thank you. Hi, um, great talk. Um, so I think you skipped this probably because of time, but can you say something about how you map the distal DHS to genes? Sure, it's a, it's a method we published last year with the ENCODE papers, and we just used the cross tissue correlation of the activity of each DHS with plus or minus 500 KB of a transcription start site. So the, um, these distal enhancers are highly cell type specific, so they sort of blink on in the cell type in which that gene is active. And so we just look for the coordinated activation of the distal DHSs and the promoter, and then that's how we draw our map. Oh, so you didn't use high c or anything like that? Okay. No, it's just based on DNAs1 data. Uh, how about these Vista elements? Are they originally found using conservation alone, or were they found using ChIP-seq or, or DNAs1 hypersensitivity or other methods that the, would? The ones for the human genome were mostly found using sequence conservation. The ones in the browser for the mouse genome have been found by both conservation and ChIP-seq for P300, which is an enhanced mark of active enhancers. Yeah, so, so did you specifically look at the ones that were found only by conservation? What fraction of those had elements? Uh, that, there's that's, that's no circular. breakdown that I could find where I could just download the ones that were identified with sequence conservation. So I just took the, all of the ones that were reproducibly driving tissue-specific expression. Yeah, so it's potentially circular. Your, uh, well, if, at some level, yes. But most of the ones for the human genome were identified just based on sequence conservation. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Great stuff. Very interesting. Thank uh, you. I was wondering, uh, uh, since this is an ethically very restrictive topic, uh, what are the samples like? Are they pathological cases or completely normal? These are uh, normal. Uh, right. they're part, they come from the birth defects lab, but these were normal fetuses. Okay. Uh, how did you address uh, maternal contamination? Mater of? Of the fetuses. The material, I, I have a feeling that it must be really tiny. Well, these are dissected organs, so there should be no maternal, I mean, the predominant amount of DNA and material if you dissect out a lung, a lung is from the fetus, not from the mother. Uh, all right, and finally, the third question is, uh, have you compared uh, these networks that you pull out with uh, modular organisms, uh, such as mice or even further down? Uh, if you're here tomorrow, you can hear Jeff Fristra's talk where he's going to discuss the differences in DNAs1 accessibility between the human genome and the mouse genome and that exact question. Great, thanks. Yeah. Very interesting talk. I have a question uh, concerning um, uh, classification of transcription factor families. So, have you, for example, observed that some TF families are more organ specific and some o some other uh, constitutive? I haven't looked at that yet, so I I'll have to do that. I've been just doing a kind of a large clustering analysis and trying to focus on the ones that are entirely organ specific, but I have not yet arranged the transcription factors themselves by families, so okay, I'll have to try that. It's interesting to get some more information which of the TFs are, how, how can they be characterized? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, thank you, Kyle, thank you. and all the other uh, speakers in this session.